Q&A. Thank you so much. Right. Thank you. Why new energy is key in 2021 and beyond? Why is innovation necessary at all? Do you remember Moore's law? Don't get confused with the Murphy's law where things go wrong at any time. Moore's law is just about things getting better. It is just the opposite of Murphy's law. Gordon Moore in 1965 predicted that the faster the technology gets, the cheaper the services become. We had experienced this through computer revolution and smartphone evolution. And we have a similar phenomena in alternate energies, that is Swanson's law. It says, when we install more and more renewables, their prices fall lower and lower, and efficiencies raise higher and higher. And this is happening with the distributed energy everywhere, and the alternative energies, are, they are absolutely disrupting the conventional existing energy networks at this moment. Everybody is a winner in this process. Let's hear from Professor Luciano, what he brings in for the solar innovations and the researches he has carried out so far. Professor Luciano Mulestango, Director, Institute of Sustainable Energy, University of Malta has a passion for heritage and environmental issues. And he has a research interest and in photovoltaic systems and the materials therein. He was earlier with Sun Edition, as director of the Worldwide Labs before moving to Malta and currently heads the Solar Research Lab. His current research focuses on off offshore solar energy projects, solar materials, and solar panels and solar systems. Professor Luciano, with his presentation titled Offshore Floating Solar Energy, the next frontier in renewable energy. Professor Luciano, the floor is yours you. for the next 20 minutes. I'm, I, you're seeing my screen, correct? That's correct. Yes, uh, so thank you for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I wish obviously I could be there in person in your beautiful country. Um, so uh, the aim of the presentation will be to discuss these things. Uh, why, where, who, when, and how offshore renewable energy. So obviously we all know that solar farms are great. Uh, they last for over 20 years. They have no moving parts. They have no noise. They're relatively cheap, but of course they do require a lot of space. A uh, hundred megawatt farm needs something on the order of a square kilometer. Um, now, how easy is it to find this much free space within or close to a large city, for example. And if you do, how much will it cost? Uh, we have seen a trend and the trend is, as I'll show in a minute, that large farms are being built, as we see here, in deserts, in uh, rural areas. But of course, these areas tend to be far from the cities. And then you have to transmit that power, sometimes tens or even hundreds of kilometers to where it is being used. And, and there's another issue. This is easy uh, solution for countries and regions with lots of free space, but not so for others. So if we look at the latest data, I picked this up a few days ago, so it might have changed actually, but uh, the largest farms are now happening in India, China, Egypt, uh, near you, United Arab Emirates, and uh, other places around the world. But all these countries have something in common, which is, of course, besides having lots of sun, they also have space. And these farms are enormous. I mean, 57 square kilometers. Uh, that's, that's pretty large. Uh, if we look, for example, at my country, I come from Malta. For those of you who are unfamiliar with Malta, Malta is an island uh, in the middle of the Mediterranean. We do have very nice climate, um, Mediterranean climate. And we do have lots of sun, but we're very, very small. Our country is only 316 square kilometers. And we do have a water problem, by the way, in relation to the previous uh, uh, presentation. In fact, we were one of the first countries to utilize and mass desalination. And uh, we have done pretty well with photovoltaic systems. In fact, uh, we're up to last year, we had about 150 megawatt peak. But, uh, and this year, 
sorry, up to 2019, 2020, we should have reached about 180 megawatt peak, but the largest farm we have in Malta is about five megawatts. There's, I think, two of those. Um, it's very difficult to find, for example, space for a hundred megawatt farm. And we do have, we are part of the European Union, and we do have very aggressive uh, goals for renewable energy. So that was the motivation for looking offshore. Now, an offshore system, a floating system, in fact, in general, even on a lake or a pond, is not that different from a normal uh, PV system. You have panels, you have a structure, uh, then you have a connection to a central inverter and a connection to a grid. The only difference, the real difference is, of course, it's on a platform and you have to anchor that platform. Now, when it comes to um, things like lakes or ponds, this is fairly straightforward because you're typically looking at uh, shallow depths and calm water. In fact, the first, I guess, first or second, because there's some argument on it, the first system that was designed on, on fresh water was in California. And the reason they put it on a pond was because it was in a winery. And of course, if you're a winery, again, tying to the previous discussion about agriculture, you want to use your land to grow the crops. And they had a big pond, so they put the photovoltaics on the pond. Now, of course, there are issues when you talk uh, about um, floating on water. You have high moisture, you have more corrosive effects, especially if you're on the sea, which is salty, and uh, the access and installation might require more planning. You have to cater for water level. Uh, if it's a pond, especially an irrigation pond, the water level might change drastically from uh, one season to the next. If you're in cold climates, luckily not our problem, either Bahrain or Malta, you have to worry about freezing. Uh, for example, Korea, uh, this is I think in Korea or China, they do worry about that. You have to worry about potential environmental impacts. So what will be the impact on the pond, the lake or the sea that you're installing in? And of course, the biggest headache possibly is you have to worry about the impact of wind and waves. This is a farm uh, in Japan. This was after, this is actually on a pond or a lake, but it was after the typhoon. And even though it was anchored and everything, because they're so light, these uh, types of floats, it actually pulled them up and uh, broke them. Now, of course, on the sea, we also have to worry about sea waves. So the advantages, however, are many. Uh, it does not use valuable land. The system can be much closer to where consumption is happening. Uh, if it's on a pond or a lake, it can reduce evaporation. So in hot countries like ours, where water is valuable, if you cover the pond, you're actually saving water and you reduce algal growth. Uh, it can have similar uh, cost to a land-based system, especially in these areas where land is not cheap. And it may perform actually better than um, a land-based system. For one thing, it will be cooler because the water will keep it cooler. But the other thing we found over the last few years doing experiments is that there's another important advantage in countries like ours, which tend to have high dust there is less dust on the water, especially on the sea. And of course, you can actively cool if you want to. And there is no shading. You're in the middle of the sea or the lake. And you can even rotate. In fact, you can build a system that rotates. And of course, it can be integrated with other uses, such as aquaculture. Now, floating systems are happening around the world. Almost all of them right now are on lakes, reservoirs, uh, ponds. Um, we are actually one of the pioneers of solar at sea. We've been doing this for about eight years now, but others are following and it's happening. Uh, in terms of solar on lakes, ponds, uh, and other areas, it's happening all around the world, uh, Middle East, uh, Asia, China especially, India now, 
and also uh, Europe and other places too. And as I mentioned, even the United States, it's already at uh, forecast to be a 2.7 billion market. So it's not a small market. Um, as of 2019, in fact, there was already about two gigawatt peak of floating solar systems. Um, all of them, as we said, were on lakes, reservoirs, or ponds, and mainly in China, Japan, Europe, and South Korea, though other areas are catching up. The types of installations, of course, if you're on a lake or a pond, not worried about waves, big waves, or high winds, especially if it's a sheltered area, typically they use these plastic type floats, sometimes they use metal floats, but uh, you have the advantage, of course, that the installation can be quite simple because the panels attach directly to these um, floats and they're using underutilized resources like freshwater bodies, they reduce evaporation, and as we said, they can be also cost competitive. Now, this is my country, this is Malta, this is where I am right now. I'm actually somewhere here. <laughs> um, this, we're an archipelago, uh, we have a very small country from here to here, it's 17 miles, and it's highly populated, it's dense, densely populated. So we don't have much space where to put large farms, for example, a 10 megawatt farm. Uh, as I said, we used, um, we have, well, I think we have about 10 larger than one megawatt farms, but they're all on either rooftops or uh, unused quarries. The other thing is we don't want to destroy agricultural land for solar farms because we don't have that much of it. So looking at offshore was a natural thing for us to do. And that's why we started early. Uh, the yellow squares here would show in, in proportion to size 20 megawatt farms if they were floating. And as you can see, uh, whereas it's difficult to imagine that on land, it's very easy to imagine it on the sea, even if you put multiple ones. In fact, even if you consider the largest solar farm in the world, which is in China, it's 1.5 gigawatt peak in a desert, of course. And this is roughly the, one, one of the largest. I think now it's actually not the largest. This is the actual size of it. And compared to my country, it would be as big or bigger than the second island. So obviously we couldn't possibly imagine putting something that large on land, but on the sea, it's another story. Now, looking at the wider context, uh, the Mediterranean, which is where I'm in. This is, this is where Malta is, right in the middle. Um, we're one of the most densely populated uh, areas, seas, and there will soon be 500 million people on the coasts of the Mediterranean. And uh, because of that, it's a ripe area for um, offshore floating solar. The other advantage is that while we do have, of course, uh, rough seas, it's not as bad as open oceans like the Atlantic and the Pacific. The other potential target for this technology is large cities, no matter where they are. So here, for example, is New York, Shanghai, and Istanbul. Very massive cities, the populated areas huge. If you wanted to you know, these people are consuming enormous amounts of energy. If you wanted to put a large solar farm, you can't possibly imagine putting it close to the city, very close to the city. You probably have to go further and further out. And if you do that, of course, there's transmission issues and cost and losses. On the other hand, the yellow square represents a 100 megawatt solar floating farm. And as you can see, in relationship, it looks tiny. But of course, you can easily put it floating right outside the city. Professor and Luciano, can you close in four minutes? Uh, yes, I will try. Uh, Bahrain, uh, you're, you're in a similar situation where, uh, where you have plenty of sea around you and you could easily put um, floating uh, areas. And of course, the general uh, Gulf area is similar in a way to the Mediterranean. It's a closed sea with large population centers. And why not? Uh, we have plenty of moored structures already, uh, fish farms, wind farms. Uh, so we know how to make uh, moored structures. Now, what we have been doing, 
our project is called Solacqua. Uh, we, we have done three phases already. First, we did the economical and technological viability at sea. We actually had a system at sea in open sea for two years. It was the first one in open sea. Uh, then we developed the design and validated it. And currently, what we're doing currently, we're actually testing in, uh, uh, in wave tanks. Uh, the next step, which hopefully will be launched next year and installed in 2022, will be to do a full-scale um, prototype. This is the uh, um, uh, waters around Malta, so we have plenty of places where we can put it. And I, I'll skip over these. This is actually some of the technical areas. We, we obviously had to worry about pitch, roll, yaw, and we were analyzing we analyze the wind and the wave environment around our country, and we designed for um, our conditions, which were uh, waves up to six meter in height. That's the maximum we can get around that we typically get around our area, and that's very rare. The typical waves are more one to two meters. Uh, the added problem is probably like Bahrain, we have uh, plenty of uses in the sea, especially close to shore. However, we have found identified areas where we can put these farms. Uh, this is actually our testing. Uh, we do not have a large wave tank yet at the university, we're building one. What we did do, we were very creative. In Malta, we have a very nice filming facilities for movies and they have a very large tank. And we actually tested in that tank in a film facility and uh, we calibrate the waves and then we, uh, we test it there. We believe that the winning technology is a large, cheap, modular floating structures, larger than 2,500 square meters, and they can cost less than one to 200 uh, euros per square meter to build, and they can be quite durable. Uh, we have demonstrated that you can gain both from the cooling effect and we have done several prototypes. These are actually some of the prototypes we've tested at sea. Um, and as we said, the next uh, step will be a full scale, actually at this location, we believe. Um, we hope to get to private funding, possibly with some EU funding for the proof of concept. And it will be designed to address all the major concerns, meaning the modules will be cheap, easy to lubricate and cost effective. They can withstand the waves with minimal overtopping. And uh, obviously we don't have tides or freezing issues. The depth of water we're considering is around 50 meter deep water. The advantage of 50 meter is you don't have to worry so much about environmental concerns because very little light penetrates beyond 50 meters. We have filed or we're filing two patents uh, one on the design actually, and one on the cooling, cooling, innovative cooling, let's see. And we have actually another patent application on a design for a floating PV tile for lakes or reservoirs, which is uh, not directly related to the sea. In the next two, three years, we will see more prototypes installed. Let's see, these are some of the other groups doing that. Norway, uh, this is actually in the Caribbean, but most of them are doing niche systems systems uh, on uh, islands in lagoons or related to fish farms. Sorry, I had to rush the last few slides, but I don't want to make you late. So thank you for your attention and uh, I'll be happy to answer questions later in the question session. Thank you. So and those much, are my professor. contact details. <laughs> thank you so much, Professor Luciano.